I'm not quite sure uh, when I really got started with bucktails because I was lucky that I grew up um, near the water in Miller Place. So when I was like 10 years old, I could just walk down the beach and go fishing anytime. And, you know, that was at a time when you could do that with your 10 year old, whereas now, you know, you would worry about your kid going someplace. But when I was young, um, I had it made. I could just grab my rod, go down the beach. And uh, that was at a time when in the town of Brookhaven, people had four wheel drive access. So it was actually a fair amount of fishing going on right at the end of my street. And I could just walk down there and go fishing and observe stuff. And um, I remember this one time where people were mostly catching bluefish. And even, I don't remember, I was like 11 or 12, whatever it was, even at that age, you know, I wanted to catch the bass. And everybody's catching blues. And there's this one guy who's just catching like bass after bass. And of course, you know, I was taking notice, what is he doing? What is he casting with? And it was a bucktail. And that's something that's always been really kind of, you know, something I remember even from that long ago that, you know, oh, look at this guy. He's getting just about all bass using that lure. What is that? And so that made an early impression. And it was a long time between then and when I really felt like I got proficient with bucktails. But, you know, that was an eye opener at a real early age that, wow, you know, that's a special lure. Yeah, I think it's really important to... Uh, be proficient with a bucktail because of its versatility. And I've said this so many times that just about any kind of fish that will strike an artificial is going to hit a bucktail. And probably even more importantly, the bucktails work under such a wide range of conditions. And if you think about where we fish, there's a big difference between going to a back bay where it's nice and calm, kind of shallow, fishing that environment versus hitting the surf when it's 10 to 12 foot waves and, and lots of white water versus going to an inlet and fishing a really heavy current. And the thing that the bucktail can do is it works well under all of these conditions. And there's really, I, I can't think of any other lures except perhaps other lead headed jigs that will work under such a wide range of conditions. So when you consider a lure that attracts just about every species of fish and does so under just about all conditions, well, that's a lure that I'd really like to be able to master. There's rarely a time where I'll say to somebody, you have to fish this way. I, I never say that. I don't want people telling me that I need to fish a certain way. Um, an exception that I'll make is when you discuss braided line versus monofilament line, especially with bucktailing. You cannot possibly get the most out of a bucktail fishing monofilament line. And there's a number of reasons for this. The big one is the stretch in monofilament. Monofilament line has a lot of stretch braid has almost none. And two issues right off with the stretch. One is um, hook setting. You know, when you go to set the hook on a fish, you have to deal with belly in the line that's introduced by both wind and sweep, um, the bend in your rod. These all take away from the energy of a hook set. The stretch will suck a lot of the life out of a hook set. So this is one big thing. The other is sensitivity. When uh, you fish monofilament line, you lose a lot of what's happening on the end of your line because the monofilament absorbs it. And I, I can think of a good example is when braid first came out, um, I started using it in fishing the, in, the inlets. And I was fishing Mauritius Inlet um, using braid, loved it right from the start. And then one day, for whatever reason, I grabbed a rod that had monofilament. It was 20 pound monofilament, the same stuff that I used for such a long time. And the, within the first couple casts, I felt like I was fishing with a big rubber band. That's how it felt to me because I was so used to the, the non-stretch braid that when I used the stretchy monofilament, it just felt terrible. Um, now, there's other things as well. I mean, first of all, when I used to use monofilament, I used 20 pound test. That was pretty much the, the going thing to use. Now I can use 50 pound braid. So I have a much stronger line, but that 50 pound braid has diameter of 12 pound test monofilament. So it's stronger, but thinner. And that thinner line allows you to use lighter weight jigs. Uh, it cuts the water better. It's just such a win-win situation. And the other one's abrasion resistance. If you get a decent fish on monofilament and it goes around rocks, the line's gonna cut. If it happens with braid, there's an excellent chance you're gonna get that fish. And what I do when this happens, and it's inevitable sometimes that a fish is gonna take you across rocks. I just back way down the drag pressure. And what will happen is that fish will run. It will drag your line against the rock and it will tire from doing that. 
When the fish finally tires, I cup the spool, pull back, pick up that line. I keep doing it. And yes, the line is dragging against the rock. But I've done this many times, saved many big fish. Some of my biggest fish have been saved by doing this. And it doesn't damage the line. It's very surprising. And I think this is because if you think about when you try to cut braid, what do you do? You apply some pressure to it. If you don't pull the braid tight before you cut it, it's like impossible to cut. So think about if you loosen up on your drag and you don't have any tension on the braid, well, guess what? It doesn't damage. So um, there are things you can do with that braid up against the rocks that you can't even think about with monofilament. So there's three good reasons right there that you should be using braid. Um, lack of stretch and um, the strength to diameter ratio and abrasion resistance. I don't tie my bucktails direct to my leader. I use a clip. And um, a good example of why I do that could be um, seen in the inlets. When you fish an inlet, it's on some jetties, those fish could be anywhere from the base of the rocks to the end of your cast. But the water depth and speed is different at the end of your cast versus up close. So you should be using a different bucktail different weight bucktail when you're targeting these different areas. Now, I would like to, you know, make a long cast or two and I don't get a hit. Well, maybe I'm going to try in a little bit closer. Well, now I want to be changing my jig and I do not want to be cutting into my leader every time I have to tie a jig. I can tell you, if you tell me that I need to cut my leader every time I change my lure, I'm not going to change my lure as often. So this is going to impact the way I fish and I want that flexibility. Now, up until the time that tactical anglers and breakaway clips came out, there was a very good reason for um, tying direct. And that was because we used to use dual locks and coast lock swivels. And when a fish grabs a bucktail, a lot of, its, a lot of times its mouth will come down right on that clip and it can open the clip. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. And even given this, the fact that I would at least once or twice a season lose a fish because it popped my clip open, I still was willing to, you know, sacrifice that to have the flexibility. And I still used a clip, even though I knew this was going to happen. Now it's not even a factor anymore. If you use a tactical angler's clip, um, you've pretty much eliminated the possibility that the clip is going to open. These are made to not open and they're made for these applications. So if you use a clip, um, a tactical angler's or breakaway, you don't have to worry about the clip opening. Um, and as far as whether you impact the action of the bucktail using a clip versus tying direct, um, I certainly don't think so. I don't think it hurts the action of the bucktail at all. In fact, I think some might argue that you might get a little more action out of the bucktail on the end of a clip than you do when you've tied direct. So definitely I go with using a clip. I usually use uh, pork rind trailers on my bucktails and I don't really have a rule of thumb about which strip to match up with which weight bucktail. Um, I find myself using a number 50 Uncle Josh pork rind a lot, and that's about a, a four and a half inch strip or a four inch strip. Um, and the reason I'm using that, especially in surf applications, is because many times I want the uh, extra flutter of having that pork rind on there, but I don't want to pay a casting distance penalty. And that strip is small enough that it's really not cutting too much into your casting distance, um, but it still gives you that nice enticing flutter. Now, I still use many other different size strips. For example, uh, the number 70 is a good size strip. It's a little bit wider, a little bit longer. So um, you can think about if I was in a shallow back bay and um, you know I don't have a lot of water and I want to have a bigger profile, maybe I'll take a half ounce bucktail and put, over, put only a number 70 strip on there. And this will give me a lure that's not going to get to the bottom very fast. I can work it slow and it's got a large profile. Um, and yet on an open beach where it's very rough and maybe I need some distance, um, big waves coming in, I might have a two ounce bucktail with just a four inch strip. So there's not really a, a rule of thumb that I use. I'm pretty much matching the pork rind strips to the, uh, the approach I want to take and, uh, you know, the, particular situation I'm fishing in. Something I think is really important with bucktails that needs to be taken into consideration is hair density. And by this I mean how much hair is tied on that jig. You can take two identical jigs and if they have different hair density, one has a lot of hair, 
or one is tied sparsely. These are entirely different lures. When I reach into my bag to grab a bucktail, uh, this is something that I'm looking at because let's consider this bucktail has a lot of hair. It's very thick. That bucktail is going to swim higher in the water column and it's going to provide a bigger profile. It's going to sink slower. These are things that under certain circumstances, maybe that's what I want. Consider the south side of Montauk where um, you're in a mostly shallow situation. The bottom is uh, cluttered with rocks and growth and so forth and you want to ride above all of that clutter. Well, you know, this is a situation where I'll be looking to maybe have a little bit of extra hair on the bucktail to swim above that. Um, does that make it a better bucktail than one that doesn't have a lot of hair on it? No, certainly not. Because consider a situation where I need distance. Maybe I need to reach a bar off a beach somewhere and, and need to hit some white water. Well, that bulky bucktail just isn't going to cast very far. I'm going to reach for one that's got a little bit less hair on it just to get that extra casting distance. So this is something that really needs to be taken into consideration when you know grabbing a bucktail to clip on the end of the line. And some people will think about um, head design when it comes to, to this situation. And I don't think too much about head design, um, except for vertical jigging for fluke. Now, what I'm interested in here is the eye placement on the head. And the eye, I mean, not, um, not the eye that looks at you, I mean the eye where you attach the line. If you consider a Spro Prime bucktail and uh, attach that to a clip and just hold it vertically, you'll see that it sits perfectly level. If you do the same to a typical, uh, let's say an Andrus or um, you know, just any off the shelf bucktail, most of those are going to hang a little bit on, on an angle. And that's fine because these bucktails, you're casting them, you're retrieving them horizontally through the water, and you know, that's okay. But if you consider vertical jigging for fluke where you're going straight up and down, I want that jig to be hanging level. So there's a consideration where, yeah, I have a preference for a head style, and it's really more of the eye placement that I'm interested in than the head style. Now, you can use head style to get a little bit deeper um, or ride a little bit higher. But to me, um, it's not as important as the hair density. For example, some people will use like an arrowhead style to get down to the bottom a little bit quicker. And certainly, you know, there is something to be said for that. But most of the time I use smiling bill style bucktails, except when I'm bucktailing for fluke. And my main concentration is on the hair density on those jigs. As far as color goes for bucktails, well, you know, this is a preference. If you were to look into my surf bag and look at my plugs, you're gonna see pretty much all the time, it's white, yellow, and black. And uh, you might see some blue in the mullet or around. So that gives you an idea of what I think about color because I'm, I'm not carrying a lot of different colors. Now with bucktails, if you only have white bucktails, I think you're gonna be just fine. However, uh, I do use wine red in the inlets at night. When I fish at night, uh, there are definitely nights I feel like the wine red is out doing the white. But again, if you only had white, you'd be okay. During the day, a color that can give you a little bit of an edge is the chartreuse, especially if the water is deep or it's a little bit murky. You know, certainly the chartreuse stands out a little bit better, but I do not go overboard with colors. Pretty much I have white, chartreuse, and wine red, and those are the three colors that I use most of the time. Open sand beaches are a real interesting place to fish bucktails, especially when you've got significant wave action because you've got a lot of variety. You have sandbars with white water. You have uh, the, the beach break right where those waves are breaking, where uh, people often refer to this as the lip. Fish love to run along that beach lip very, very close to shore. Um, you have points where the water is one depth on one side and a, a little bit shallower on the other side. There's different wave heights on the different sides of the point. Um, so you have a lot of variety of structure. And to work these efficiently, a lot of times you need to change your bucktail weights, you need to change your retrieves. You need to vary your retrieve on a single cast. For example, when you're pulling your bucktail in towards the shore and it's coming in with a wave, you need to pick your retrieve up a little bit to keep up with that wave. And now when a wave breaks and goes out and you're pushing that jig into another toe, 
you need to drop that retrieve speed down because your bucktail is going into the force of the water. So there's a lot of intricacies about fishing a sand beach. On the other hand, it's also the simplest place to learn because if you hit the bottom, if you're fishing too heavy, it's okay. You're just hitting the bottom of the sand. You're not going to snag your jig and lose it. So there's a lot of room to learn on the sand beaches. Rocky beaches are an excellent place to bucktail, but they require a lot of local knowledge. I mean, the rocky beaches are good because the rocks attract fish. The rocks break the current. They attract a lot of bait fish and, and growth. So they hold the bass. The problem is trying to work a bucktail in these areas can be tough because it's very simple. You're going to be snagging rocks. But with you know putting some time in, you'll find places where you can swim that bucktail and not get snagged. And it's as simple as that. Once you locate these areas, um, these can become some very predictable fish producers. So it's just a matter of putting your time in, getting that local knowledge, knowing where can you work a bucktail without hanging it up. I make my own bucktails because I want certain kinds of bucktails. For example, if I go to a rocky shoreline and um, I would like a three quarter ounce bucktail with a fair amount of hair, but a pretty strong hook. Okay, I can go to my local tackle shop and cull through many bucktails and maybe find some like what I want. Or during the winter, I can just tie precisely what I want. And that's one example of a type of bucktail I want. Um, another is, I really like two and a half ounce bucktails for fishing inlets. I have not seen these in the store. I mean, they seem to have two ounce bucktails and three ounce bucktails and nothing in between. There's a huge functional difference between two and three ounces. So I'll pour my own, tie my own, and I have exactly what I want. Um, then I can experiment a little bit or I can do some variations. I like to tie hackle feathers on the hook shanks of some of my bucktails. It gives them a little more body, a little more bulk. Um, just things like this, customizations and just basically being able to fish with exactly the lures I want to fish with. Okay, so as far as retrieving a bucktail, you know, if I was to teach somebody pretty much from scratch about bucktailing uh, in any situation, but let's just say the beaches, I think the first thing I would do is uh, I have some video of three-way bucktailing in a boat. I think I would show them that video, even if they were beach fishermen. And the first thing I would say is, okay, here's a technique used by commercial fishermen whose only interests are to put pounds of fish in the boat, go out, fill that boat, hit the bank. That's what they're interested in. This is a very, very productive technique. And then we'd watch this technique. And what you would see is that these guys are dropping these rigs to the bottom, picking up a couple cranks and just holding it steady. They're not jigging, they're not bouncing. Their only interest is to swim the bucktail along the bottom contour. That's all they do. And this is a, just a devastating technique and works very well. And if you look at that and you watch fish, you know, hitting that presentation, which is nothing more than the swimming bucktail, then I think that makes an impression that, okay, I don't want to be bouncing the bottom. I don't even actually have to impart any action. If this thing is just swimming near the bottom, it's going to catch fish. Okay, so I'm not saying that you shouldn't impart action on it. I definitely impart action. I give it little lifts and twitches and so forth. And this is definitely a good thing to do because you can imagine that a fish that has keyed in on a lure, whether it's a bucktail or anything, and then all of a sudden that lure takes a little bit of a, a surge forward, well, that could trigger a strike because the fish might think, you know, it's, it's trying to escape. So certainly I'm putting lifts and twitches, but to watch the video of three-way bucktailing where you're not putting any action on it, you're just gliding along the bottom and boom, these nice fish are hitting that jig. Uh, to me, you know, that's a, a very educational thing. And the reason I kind of harp on this is because I know that that kind of fishing had a huge influence on my bucktailing because I was like, oh my God, look how well this works. This is unbelievable. This is all I really need to do. And I need to do this in every setting. I need to do this in the inlets. I need to do this in, in the back bays where, you know, the bottom depth is changing. So it's just made a huge impression on my bucktailing.